Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. So there are two types of people in the world. And uh, when I just said that, if you're a 30-something or 40-something female, you probably in your mind want it to say the ones that entertain and the ones that observe. No. So what I'm really talking about is emergency management. So in emergency management, we say there are people that naturally run away from emergencies, and then there are people that counterphobically run towards them. So I have always been one of the latter. In my family, my grandfather was a fire chief. My mom was a paramedic before I was born. My cousin uh, still is a, a volunteer firefighter at the same station that, that our grandfather was chief at. So this has naturally been um, a stream, kind of a current that has run throughout my life. And when people ask me, how did you get into ICS security? Like, tell me your story. How did you get to where you are? The truth is that um, I started in government. I worked for the Commonwealth of Virginia doing traditional critical infrastructure protection. We're talking like 2007, 2008 timeframe. And I learned incident command system. I learned NIMS. I learned the foundations of emergency management. And from that, I met a gentleman uh, that was working at GE named Corey Jackson. And he changed my life because he said, you know, Megan, I've known your work through the Commonwealth of Virginia. I know that you know emergency response. I know that you know how to run incidents. And so I want to recruit you into GE. And so um, for years, I, I, I basically was like, I don't know. I kind of feel like an imposter. I'm an emergency manager trying to get into cybersecurity, trying to understand it. But he, he gave me a chance. And so I just want to say that's how I got here. And the other night, um, we, we were talking with some folks, of course, at Beer ISAC, and they said, yeah, like, what, 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 are, what are nicknames that people have? Well, everyone, you know, commonly knows me as Megantron, but my real first nickname that I love the most also happened at GE. My real nickname was PCERT. PCERT stands for Product Security Incident Response Team. True story, you can ask folks at GE that were working there maybe six or seven years ago, I, um, I had given birth to my son, so he's six now. He turned seven in August, so that's roughly the time frame. And something had happened, and the SOC director said, when's PCER getting back from maternity leave? So um, it, it was cool, and that, that made me feel good because it made me feel needed. But through that, though, the more I thought about it, I said, there are a lot of good principles from emergency management that we should be importing and, and, and dropping into cyber. Cyber does not need to be unique. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, is I'm going to update you on three things. The first is, what has happened in the past two years with the ICS for ICS program? Incident command system for industrial control systems. What happened? Secondly, we did a huge exercise on Monday. It was awesome. If you couldn't be there, it was recorded. Definitely go back and check it out. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the next steps and how can each of you be involved. Um, I would just have a quick show of hands. How many of you all have participated in responding to a cyber incident as part of your role now or, or in the past even? Yeah, so I mean, most of us here, right? So I, I think, I hope that you find the content relevant. And my ask of you all is that after this talk, go back and do some research and see what you want to copy and steal. I'm a big fan of the case methodology. It means copy and steal everything. It's OK. We need to be sharing the information. So bringing it back present, um, <laughs> two years ago, what did we discuss? We discussed. We didn't have a common response framework, which makes scaling incidents nearly impossible outside of a singular company. That's it. You know, Dale says in your prep, like, make your one minute count. It's kind of like a Pete Davidson moment where I'm like, we don't have response scans at scale. That's it. That's the statement, right? The next was the cost that we were all bearing due to poorly coordinated responses. I saw the hands out there, and you're not alone. This stuff is hard. Uh, response fatigue is a very real thing. And so we know that these responses and the lack of efficiency within the responses, it's costing us all. It's costing us people, because they get fatigued and they leave. It's costing us people, money, and stuff, OK? And so that's really what we want to save when we talk about resources and responding appropriately. The next point was that, to this day, Cyber was the only and is the only 
designated federal disaster type not currently using incident command system for its response framework. Seriously, look it up. Don't take my word for it. Um, there are two types of disasters, man-made and natural. Cyber obviously falls under man-made. We're the only one not formally adopting the system. The next is that incident command system solves for many, if not most, of the 25 common failures of modern catastrophes. If you don't know him, Dr. Kenneth Crowther is one of my favorite people in this industry. He's one of the most humble, he's one of the most genuine, and I believe that he's presenting on this topic here. Definitely um, check out that talk as well. But Incident Command System does address the points that he will bring up. And basically, for the past 250 years, when they examined events like um, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, they all had roughly the same 25 failures that they saw in the response every single time. The next was that we needed some consistency in cyber incident response roles. So many of you all in the audience, I saw your hands, you, you have some degree of experience. And so with that, when you go job to job, or um, even if you were supporting another organization that you didn't know that well, wouldn't it be nice, just like first responders have today, paramedics, firefighters, to say, this is what I'm credentialed to, this is what I have trained to, I've taken the FEMA training, I have the experience, you can depend on a reliable experience and a reliable training experience with me as a responder. And that's really what typing the assets is about. I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would make a bet if you look at critical infrastructure statistics, if 85% of critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector, do we also believe under that same logic that 85% of our response force is in the private sector? We do not have an accurate way to count the number of cyber responders we have, how many malware reverse engineers we have versus network communications analysts. We, we don't know, we don't know. We don't know nationwide, and in many cases, I don't even know if we know company by company, okay? So this is really about better management of the resources that we have available to us. And, and of course, yes, we did. We talked about chainsaw strike teams and tree removal task forces. And I bring that up because when I first got on this stage two years ago, it's a bit intimidating, it's a bit terrifying because you can't really see into the audience and there's these lights and I really heard no reaction to what I was saying, an incident command system for industrial control systems was a super new concept. And so I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going so well. But then I, I said something about chainsaws and strike teams and people were like, yeah. Yeah, we, we want to know more about this. So I had to bring that up. I had to go out on a limb there, which you may want to be careful with if the chainsaw strike team is running around. And through all of this, it was enough to give the effort, the momentum, the volunteers, and the sponsorship through the ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance to get this off the ground. And so special thanks to two people right off the gate, Dale Peterson, this talk would be nothing. It was a phone conversation three years ago, and he said, Megan, I think that this could actually be a really good idea that could work. This could do a lot of good. And secondly is Andre Rostano. He's the managing director of the ISA GCA, and he said, I think that there's a lot of weight behind this. He put the resources and the funding and everything behind it. So if you see Andre, please thank him, because he's been kind of the heart and the lungs behind this as well. So. Um, I have this ridiculous picture of me up here. I, I did have the opportunity to testify before Congress. It was the honor of my life. Being a little girl from Nowhereville in Southern Virginia, this, this was something that in my life I never would have thought that I would have had the chance to do something like that. But it was a huge credit to Department of Homeland Security and others that said, this needs to get in front of Congress. They need to be updated on what this is and see what momentum we can, we can further get behind it. But really, in my talk to Congress, I talked about a few points. I talked about the fact that, a little bit of what I just discussed with you all, and that we have non-standard terminology against responding entities. Every company has their own playbook, and it's written for that company. And it's normally pretty lengthy, but it's not interoperable, we don't have common language. Um, again, it goes back to the scaling problem. But there's a general lack of capability to expand and contract staffing and other resources, 
non-standard and non-integrated communications, as well as a lack of consolidated action plans. And so again, I do want to thank Congress for the opportunity to present to them. And the key thing that I asked of Congress at that time was they said, well, from a policy perspective, how could Congress begin to take steps to, to get this into action? How, how do we do this from a policy perspective? And I said, the easiest policy or, or where there's precedent in the past, at least, is with Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5, HSPD 5, which mandated the, uh, the alignment and it mandated federal agencies to follow incident command system following 9-11. And since they've done that, um, they've, they've seen tremendous efficiencies, obviously, in their response. And so what I suggested is I said, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not supportive of uh, the federal government mandating the private sector to adopt incident command system. But I, I would be very favorable to HSPD-5 being updated to highly encourage the adoption of incident command system within the private sector. And so that's where that landed. So where are we today? We have over 1,000 global volunteers. We completed our first round of credentialing of cyber incident commanders. It was Mark Bristow, Neil Gay, Brian Wisniewski, and myself. And we're currently also now using, remember the credentialing and the typing thing I just talked about? We're now using the FEMA One Responder system to hold our credentials. So we're, we're working hand in hand with Department of Homeland Security. And, and thank you so much to Department of Homeland Security for offering this capability to us. It was exactly what we needed. And oh, by the way, everything that I'm talking about today is it's free, really. I, I'm, not, I'm not selling you anything. So. Over the past two years, I, I want to be completely honest with you all. I, I have a full-time job, which keeps me busy already. Um, I have a family. And so everything that has been done over the past two years, it has been a volunteer army. And so I, I wanted to take a moment and thank Mark Bodie and Philip Koch. They, they developed the exercise materials. Catherine Hutton, unfortunately, couldn't be here with us this week. She wanted to be. But she's been leading the awareness and outreach efforts. Michael Cheney, thank you so much. He's been leading the training team. Eric Peterson, thank you. Anne Marie Vandekirk, as well as Durgesh Kayla for developing the ICS for ICS certification process and being kind of liaisons with FEMA on getting used to the one responder system and getting that stood up. So thank you all to all of the global volunteers that have made this possible. It hasn't been me. It has been everyone else. And so that's, that's why we we get the opportunity to be here today. My boss, Bruno, he always says, when we, when we solve hard problems, we earn the right to try to solve tougher problems. And so that's really what this is about right now. So I'm going to give you just a really quick kind of down and dirty ICS for ICS on ramp so you have context into what in the world were we exercising again, what is the system for, in case you weren't here two years ago. So um, this is. Uh, someone said the other day, um, I think they, it was someone from Mandia, they said it is uh, incident command system in a nutshell is the most basic form of rocket science you will ever use. Okay? So ICS for ICS for purposes of our discussion today, which by the way, I, I really could make the argument that ICS for ICS certainly is applicable to managing any type of cyber incident. It doesn't necessarily have to be one involving control systems, but three components industrial control systems, uh, cybersecurity, the traditional computer incident response teams, and industrial control systems, incident command system and industrial control systems. My apologies. So this is the methodology around FEMA planning processes, your local first responders. This planning cycle would look super familiar to them. They all know it. So it involves planning, organizing, training, equipping, exercising, evaluating, and taking corrective action. I, I want to make a brief comment on this slide. Um, I see exercises in many organizations, whether it's a facilitated discussion, which is kind of a very informal, laid back, it's, it's really a learning opportunity. People are using exercises to train their staff. They're not actually training on their response plans, so they're skipping, they're skipping so much. They're going from planning to exercising. And so I do encourage you all, follow the complete cycle. You're, you're going to see productivity from that. The next is, why use incident command system anyway? 
It's a standard approach. It's proven to be effective. I mean, I said the other day in the exercise, you know, why, why could I or should I, just being a person in cyber, believe that I could create a response framework and structure that is somehow better than what first responders globally have been using since the 1970s? I don't think that we can, and we want to be integrating with them as well. ICS for ICS also gives you unity of, unity of command. It gives you clarity of responsibilities. It gives you span of control. What span of control means, and this is very significant when you're running incidents, is that uh, the best span of control is no one person should have more than five people they are managing during an incident. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I just misspoke there. They should have no more than seven. It's three minimum, seven is max, with five being optimal. You have common terminology. You have adaptability to size and complexity. And this can be used for planned and unplanned events. I think someone said that they used it to plan a retirement party the other day. I was like, it's pretty cool. I could see it working. Uh, the next is unity of effort, and then finally, accountability. So with every role, especially the incident commander role, the buck stops with you. So you're often in charge of life safety decisions, and you are, you are held accountable to that. And the weight of those decisions, um, you have them during the response, and that's OK. But the structure works to, su to support all of the responders throughout that entire effort. So this is the planning P process. So again, this is context into what do we do with the exercise. So the planning P cycle, basically, it tells you when you meet. You can see at the bottom here, it starts from event notification, and it goes up. It goes to incident briefing forms. You have regularly scheduled meetings. You don't kind of have to you know, be grabbing your phone all the time saying, when's the next you know, crisis management call or something like that? Do you know when it's going to be planned? So-and-so go schedule the call. So-and-so, are you taking notes? Um, no, this is a process that runs much more effectively than that. And you know what your operational period is, whether that's six hours, eight hours, 10 or 12 hours, that's already defined. So the whole takeaway from the planning P process is that it provides you structure, timing, templates, and it kind of automates a lot of the things that you don't want to be wasting time on when you really want to be just responding. So now we're getting into the exercise. So what happened during the exercise? So the purpose was really just to test out the framework. The other purpose was that many of the volunteers within ICS for ICS have taken the online FEMA training courses. So they've completed their requirements for credentialing on that end. But another requirement that we have is that you actually have to have successfully done the role that you're applying to credential for. Um, or you, you have to attend an exercise and basically get the experience that way. And that's also allowed in the traditional FEMA incident command system. And so the objectives of the exercise were really to monitor events to identify possible incidents, perform notification, complete an initial assessment, and determine if an incident should be declared. That, that's a significant step in the process. Stand up the ICS for ICS structure, as well as work on remediation and resolution of the incident itself. So you see here, uh, Mark Bristow had already been predefined as the incident commander. We were very lucky that, that this company and the exercise, that he was there and he was willing to take on the role. So this is the famous ICS for ICS org chart. I'm really surprised that we haven't seen more revisions of this. I think that we'll probably be working on them in the future. But this is pretty much the same one that we presented um, two years ago. And so you see the positioned outline in red there. Those were the ones that our incident commander, Mark Bristow, said, based on what I'm seeing in my initial assessment, I need these folks lined up. So that's how we went in. And this was the incident briefing form. And you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what the scenario was, because the scenario is not important. And I always tell people during exercises, do not fight the scenario. That's not the point of the exercise. And so this was what's called an incident briefing form. And so the incident commander, when Mark came in, he briefed his staff, and he said, this is what's going on. And it was an issue where the HVAC system was not acting correctly, and they needed to dive in and figure out what was going on, because they couldn't rule out cyber uh, as a likely cause. And the technicians believed that it was not just a typical fault with the equipment. 
So they went through the planning peace cycle. They did this twice within the exercise. And so if you were there, you saw like, you see the forms, you see the process, you see the agreement, you see the alignment that takes place. And all of this runs really smoothly. These were the forms that were demonstrated and used within the exercise. And again, these forms are free. You can go to the FEMA website right now and download all of these forms. And so um, one that we'll kind of double click on here that I find super helpful is this is an org chart. And again, you can download these forms. But you see the different roles that were in play. And this is a common form that's used within the incident command system. So the after action review, how did it go? So these were the top three strengths as identified by the audience. We, we did not write these. So they said that the NIMS incident command system is widely used for most incidents, and they really like the fact that it had the all hazards component. Because again, this was an HVAC issue. And in my experience, when you're running incidents, um, what an incident looks like when it first comes in is JDLR. It's a very scientific term. It stands for just doesn't look right, OK? And with that, you can't determine if it's a fault with the equipment or if it was cyber. And so you kind of have to run both arms of the investigation at the same time to really figure out what's going on. And so the all hazards um, nexus to this, the, the cyber and the physical, and the ability to have what's called unified command, uh, the audience really liked that. The next was that ICS for ICS was built using NIMS and ICS forms from FEMA. Um, the forms help you make decisions. They help you have access to the data at your fingertips, and you're not needing to create um, you know, formalized and sophisticated documents while you're in the heat of running an incident. You, you don't want to bother with that. And so people like that aspect uh, as well. They also liked uh, the fact that ICS for ICS enables consistent and quick decision making. And so it, it prevents um, sometimes the paralysis that can come from things like response fatigue. And it helps uh, ensure that everyone is executing against the same set of objectives and people are trying to rally around the same set of decisions. And so one thing that ICS for ICS gives you that I try to tell any leadership that I work for is that my job is to give you data so that you can make decisions. And I'm hoping that I'm giving you data that gives you maneuverability. You need, man you need maneuver room when you're running an incident. And the less structured an incident is, the less maneuver room you're going to have. So um, three items that required improvement. So after action plans, uh, AARs always have what's called an improvement plan. And so this was that um, it took time for folks to get familiar with the forms. And so it goes back to the training that's needed to properly work and fully get the benefits that you want to out of using incident command system. Um, they said, hey, if you could have kind of given us a heads up about what each form was for, we could have had that kind of in a briefing package ahead of time. That's definitely something we want to incorporate into future exercises. Um, we also needed to explain in the hot wash that ICS for ICS is not a democracy. Um, the incident commander is in charge. Again, I, I said that's where the buck stops. And, and with that, there, there is ways, and there's different meetings that occur throughout that planning peace cycle that was a few slides back, where you're looking for alignment. And one of the most difficult jobs that any of us have, I don't care if you're in cyber or uh, if you're a makeup artist or, or whatever your job is, alignment is a difficult exercise. Getting consensus and alignment from everyone that you're working with, that's what all of us really have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so incident command system provides formalized structure to have positive conflict and work issues out in proper vehicles and proper settings. Uh, they also said that we, uh, we should describe the roles that would be normally staffed in a real incident as needed. And so there was some you know, confusion over, well, you had a safety officer, but this person was checking on uh, physical safety. They were looking at different environmental aspects involved in the response. You know, is that really realistic to think that someone would have all of that experience as, as a defined safety officer? And so we explained that you have sub-teams of people that are experts in those areas to advise the chief safety officer. And the next was that a liaison officer may be needed to interface with government, DHS, FBI, ISACs, ISO, ISOs, and, and all of those as well. 
Um, so additional just comments and remarks from the exercise that we wanted to capture was that uh, small companies may need help getting up to speed on ICS for ICS. The exercise itself was designed for what's called a type three incident, where it's single company, single asset incident. Um, type two, you're moving up in scale, and then type one is the largest scale incident possible. And so they said we may need to kind of um, double down and think how to explain to smaller companies how they would adopt the structure and why it would benefit them as well. The ICS for ICS team, um, we are going to be assisting industry sectors in hosting different exercises, um, which would address the smaller companies like utility operators and others. Um, DOA is critical to be able to, uh, to, be able to finance the, um, the incident response efforts. The IC also provides delegation of authority or obtains authority from executives. Uh, remember way back many slides ago, I said that the part about investigating an initial notification to determine if something was really an incident, determining if something actually meets the threshold for being an incident is a key part in all of our roles now. Um, the last item here, ICS for ICS processes, forms, and other resources can be used for big or small incidents, absolutely. And the size of the ICS for ICS team will vary greatly based on the incident. We had five or six people responding. Um, I have seen incident commands stood up with just three people, the incident commander, the planning section chief, and the ops section chief. So um, the future of all of this, where do we want to take it? Um, we will be conducting exercises globally. I mentioned that we have 1,000 volunteers globally. Many of them are from the five I countries. New Zealand and Australia have been especially keen to pick this up. I believe that they're standing up their own ICS for ICS programs as well. Uh, we want to offer ICS for ICS credentials and training globally. We want to grow the base of people with expertise in ICS for ICS as well as manage credentialing with the FEMA National Qualification System, the one responder system. Again, let's, that was such a big deal to be able to use the system and to be working hand in hand with DHS on this. It's, it's an honor. Um, I'm happy to say that we did it, and I want to credential more people. I would love for everyone in this audience, if you have a cyber response role, I would love you to go back and consider getting into our process to become, to become credentialed yourself. And next is that we want to expand processes and capabilities globally. We want to continue to grow this out. We want to customize the forms. We want to create a lot of the content that we know will be needed as folks are standing up their own programs. And eventually, we'd like to get to the point where we're even offering templates where organizations can support each other uh, through mutual aid. We see that a lot. The, the worst time to try to work out an NDA is when you're in the middle of a response. So um, what does this mean for you? Uh, how can you get involved? Register for the ICS for ICS newsletter. Observe or participate in an ICS for ICS exercise. Host an ICS for ICS exercise at a public event or in your company. Uh, join our team and help us. If there's a particular area that you know, you're just super interested in, um, we want to we wanna get you engaged. And lastly, um, consider presenting on the topic. Go to, go to conferences, be a formal ambassador. Um, many folks are now doing that, and, and we want that to get the word out so that people know what this is, they know it's free, they know they can take the training. Like, we can do this. I, I really, I think that we have a really good shot. And uh, I just, again, I, I want to thank everyone because I, I wouldn't be here if it if it wasn't for the volunteers, they've, they are what has kept this alive and kept this going. And it, it, the opportunity to do this just means so much to me. So again, thank you.